morning. This is the 21st Sunday of the Pentecost season. I know you're all keeping track. <laughs> yeah, I'll be calling your attention to the last page of your bulletin. Our prayer list, I think I have edited and updated, but be sure to let me know if there are additions you would like made to that prayer list. In our announcements, morning Bible study is continuing at 9 before our Sunday worship, and we are studying 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. They're all real short, and they all go together very well, so it is not too late to join us for Bible study on Sunday morning. We still, do we still have that calendar in the back, John, or have we tossed those? The calendar of events for the church? Yes. Check that out. If you haven't gotten one, you can take that home and put it on your refrigerator and know what's happening here at Emmanuel. We have a potluck <coughs> following worship today as we say farewell to Pastor Steve and Joanne and thank them for all of their work here among us. We're not going to get teary yet. We'll save that for later. Uh, a reminder that the food bank donations are being matched by Pound Pump through the end of November. So if you have uh, cash that you would like to give, please designate that and we'll get it all turned in. It will be matched. The Hunter's Breakfast, the 25th, which is a Friday, wear orange. It says we begin at 8. I've seen posts that say we begin at 8.30, but we're beginning at 8. Uh, I invite you to like and share the Emmanuel Facebook page, and we're going to be launching that website. Finally, yes we are. Um, around Thanksgiving. Soft launch the week before to make sure we have it perfectly <coughs> so that we can, we can share that with everyone. Um, other announcements that may be there, please read. At this time, I give it over to our council president, Steve Oslin, for an announcement. On uh, September 23rd, I received a message from the call committee stating, and I quote, the call committee has unanimously voted to proceed with the call of Judy Manweiler, unquote. The council has approved the terms of service pending congregational approval of the call. The next step in the call process is the formal approval of the call by the congregation in a special meeting. That meeting will be held in two weeks after the worship service on Sunday, October 27th. Yay. Thank you all very much. I am humbled at this moment. And I will turn it over to Sandy for a prelude as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. My prelude this morning is called Bacchiana on an Ancient Corral. And I guess that means in the spirit of Bach. And it is, seems like rather chaotic at times, but then so is life. But in the end, God is with us. Thank you. 
one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into our own sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown. Things we have done and things we have failed to do, turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in the newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been marked and saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Our gathering song is 669, Rise Up, O Saints of God. of the whole world, for the well-being of 
of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. A reading from Psalm 112. Please read responsibly with me. Happy are those who fear the Lord. Who greatly delight in his commandments. Their descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses. And their righteousness endures forever. They rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with those who deal generously and lend. Who conduct their affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. They are not afraid of evil tidings. Their hearts are firm, secure in the Lord. Their hearts are steady. They will not be afraid. In the end, they will look in high upon their foes. They have distributed... They have distributed freely. They have given to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their glory is exalted in honor. The wicked see it and are angry. They gnash their teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked comes to nothing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat>
You know, it's nice when the people put their hands together and in such offer praise to God. Uh, those men in that choir and Dan, they do a great job week after week, and I really commend them. It's, it's a small but powerful uh, group of singers, and um, it comes from not just their mouths, I hope you see. It comes from their soul. Uh, before I begin this morning, I just, I, I want to say, well, for one thing, it's really hard for me to believe that this is the last time that I get to share the Word of God with you. But before I get into our text for today, I, I want to say some words of thanks. You know, I've never served a congregation of this size before. We've never lived in a town this size before. And I am so impressed with who you are and what you have done and how you hang in there faithfully, not just week after week or month after month, but year after year after year. You know that the world changes and pastors come and go and people live and die and our children get launched and our grandchildren launch, but you are here week after week holding forth the word of God, the truth, the foundation of Christian faith. And I commend you. I, I, you know, it was back in January, February, I first got some phone calls and emails from, uh, there were three or four people that said, you need to go there, you need to go there, you need to go there. And then Steve breaks the silence, kind of, or the noise, and sends some emails and some texts. And it has been such a gift and blessing for Joanne and I to be here. And you have gotten so much done in the last six, seven, eight, ten months. You really have. You had a really rough ending to the last pastor when he left. Well-loved, well-loved pastor. And there were some wounds and some hurts, and some of them still exist, perhaps. But you've held fast. You've hung in there. You've kept moving forward. You launched an internship committee, a call committee, and you heard Steve announce this morning a congregational meeting for the 27th of this month. What exciting news in short order. You have, as part of your congregation, a woman that has already been trained in marvelous ways through lay parish associate uh, ministry, and now finishing up her last months of her Master of Divinity. This is not an easy road to hoe, let me tell you. Been there done that. There's all of high school, there's all of college, and now a master's degree. And she's no spring chicken, in case you hadn't <laughs> Um I hope I said that gently. <laughs> and so to, to, to put the nose to the grindstone and book it uh, week after week, month after month, to write these papers is no small task. She's certainly done it for the kingdom of God, but she's also done it for the people of this congregation. And I hope you see that, and I hope you appreciate that, and I hope you embrace that, and I hope you pray for her in the days, weeks, months, and years to come. Because it's a great challenge to serve a congregation, a Christian congregation in the 21st century. And so um, I just could not be happier for you all. Um, I have agreed to continue to be uh, Judy's internship supervisor until she finishes up her Master of Divinity, so I will be keeping tabs on you, Judy, <laughs> and I will be keeping tabs on you through Judy and through what I see remotely uh, as Joanne and I head back to Arizona. But as since it's my last sermon uh, that I get to preach to you today, I've chosen two particular texts that are really close to my heart. They're both from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. And why these two texts? Because they're close to my heart, but they've got a word, a word, a very clear word to speak to every single Christian and every single Christian congregation. And I want you to remember this word. It's sort of like parting shot, if you will, across the bow to you, that I want to leave with you in a memorable way. In fact, this sermon and this phrase might be something that almost defines 
defines my life and ministry in the last numbers of years. And they come from 1 Corinthians, these texts. And we have to remember, as always, the context in which we find this text. First of all, there were lots of challenges, like any congregation, Paul's writing to a church in the city of Corinth. And Corinth itself was an enormous challenge because it was known as one of the most decadent cities in all of the ancient world. It was a Roman colony, and it was home to more than a dozen pagan temples that employed thousands of temple prostitutes. Corinth's reputation was such that prostitutes in other cities began to be called Corinthian girls. I mean, this is Las Vegas on steroids. Yeah, in, in the New Testament, we think Las Vegas is something new. But in, unlike Las Vegas, what happened in Corinth didn't stay in Corinth. It was spread all around the world. And here's another thing that was happening, and it's reflective of what's happening in our lives as well. There was, there was this almost a new age kind of worship. All kinds of gods were worshipped. Paul mentioned it in, when he was in Ephesus in Acts 17. He said, I noticed that you even, this is the Ephesus, but it was true in the ancient world. He said, you're very, very religious. I even noticed a, a statue to an unknown god. Well, this is what was happening in Corinth as well. They seem to be flitting from one fad to another fad. And I think that's certainly part of our contemporary religious or spiritual culture. But perhaps uh, the most vexing problem that this congregation uh, faced, and, and I want you to remember that Paul founded this congregation. These people were near and dear to his heart. And he had gotten word that they were dividing into factions. They were fighting with one another, trying to one-up each other, bragging about who their leader was. So here are some of Paul's first words to this church in chapter 1. He says, I have a serious concern to bring up with you, my friends. I'll put it as urgently as I can. I've heard a most disturbing report that you're fighting among yourselves that you're picking sides, going around saying, I'm on Paul's side, or I'm for Apollos, or Peter is my man, or I'm in the Messiah's group. I ask you, has the Messiah been chopped up in little pieces so we can each have a little relic all our own? Was Paul crucified for you? Was a single one of you baptized in Paul's name? Absolutely not, he said. Then he goes on to remind them about the foundation of our lives and of the church, Jesus Christ. And God, through the Apostle Paul, gives some important and life-changing things to say to each of us this morning. And I'd like to read them for you in just a moment. Let's stand as we sing the Alleluia. Corinthians chapter 2. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the testimony of God to you with superior speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were made not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with the demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. And then this snippet from 1 Corinthians 3. According to the grace of God given to me like a wise master builder, I lay the foundation and someone else is building on it. Let each builder choose with care how to build on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which has been laid, that foundation is Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. 
Will you join me in prayer? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of your church, the body of Christ. And I thank you for these brothers and sisters that have so graced Joanne's in my life in the last months. And I thank you for your word to us, your living word of truth. May it bubble up inside us and be what you have called it, living water. And may it worm its way into our hearts and minds and souls past our defenses and our I've always thoughts, our suppositions, and may it there rest and take root that our lives might be changed, our outlook changed, our understanding transformed. To that end, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Many years ago, we were visiting friends in Los Angeles, and I happened to see a book on her shelf that just really intrigued me, a two-word, a three-word title, three-word title, Th um, Things That Matter. And I thought, well, that's a curious title, Things That Matter. It's by Charles Crossheimer. In the opening line, he asks, what matters? And he responds, the lives of the good and the great, the innocence of dogs, the cunning of cats, the elegance of nature, the wonders of space, the perfectly thrown outfield assist. What matters? Manners and habits, curiosities and conundrums. What matters? Occam's razor, Fermat's last theorem, Fermati paradox. I'm sorry, I had no clue what they meant. I looked them up, I don't have a clue what they even now say. And I read that opening and I thought, really? A perfectly assist outfield play? Matters? Manners and curiosity? Things that matter? Truly, really. Let me ask you, what are the things that matter? in your life. If you were to ask me, I would say my wife, my children, my grandchildren, and my faith. In fact, I think that the thing that covers so much in my life, even my family, is my faith. And after that, there's a close second, I have to admit, and that's the church. That's the place where my faith has been planted and nurtured and in which I've labored most of my adult life. But you know, in life and in the church, it's often easy to get sidetracked and we forget the things that really matter. I had a professor in Bible school once that said, we tend to major in minors. You get it? Don't we do that? We major in minors and lose focus. Happens to me all the time. And uh, sometimes when I kind of worry myself into a place where I'm obsessed or I'm OCD about something, I have to kind of come up and take a breath and remember the things that really matter. Many years ago, someone came up to me after a sermon I preached and they gave me a little stone on which were engraved some really important words that have really tried to remind me always of what really matters. And here's what's inscribed on that stone. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. It's attributed to Albert Einstein and a lot of other people, but listen to it again. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Will you say it with me? The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So now, week after week, year after year, when you come here, 
or you're worrying yourself into this tizzy, I hope you'll remember that phrase. And in fact, like we did last week, I'd like it to become this little refrain as we proceed in the sermon. I'd like you to respond with those words. I will say, the people of God know that, and you reply, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. You ought to be able to remember that, right? The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Twelve words, just repeated three times, right? It's a, And what is that main thing when it comes to our faith? Well, it's a little bit of a paraphrase of what we read from 1 Corinthians. But I think the main thing is Jesus Christ, crucified, resurrected, and living. Jesus Christ, crucified, resurrected, and living. You know, it's easy to forget that, even in the church. Sometimes our personal preferences get in the way, don't they? Like when it comes to worship. Some of us really love the organ and all the liturgy and all the hymns. Others of us like the piano. Some of us like contemporary worship, praise songs, ripped jeans and t-shirts on the preacher. Some may want only a male in the pulpit. Others, one particular pastor, our all-time favorite pastor. They brought the gospel. But the people of God know that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus Christ, crucified, resurrected, and living. Sometimes our personal history, even our ethnicity and background can get in the way of the main thing. Some of us want to use only the King James Version. Some of us the old RSV or the NRSV or the NIV or the ESV or the Message, right? All these different versions of the Bible, they're the only ones that convey the Word of God. Some of us think that we should begin every single service singing holy, 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 and possess down the aisle, right? That's how it began when I was young, holy, holy, holy. Others go want to go back to the Lutheran book of worship. That was so comfortable and well-known. It was comfortable for me, or some like the service book and hymnal, the red one. Remember that one? I love the old that that old language. I just love that. Wherefore we flee for refuge to thine infinite mercy. Don't you love that? Some even want to go back to the old, old black Lutheran hymnody. Still others think that we should serve up worship in Norwegian or German. You know, Kandus Nuffin Norsk, yeah. But the people of God know that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. You know, Emmanuel, you've got an incredible 127-year-old history. You've been served by some great preachers. But you know, people can lose the, the sense of the main thing many times, even in a history like that. A church I served not long ago was going through a, a major, major remodel. And we were taking out the pews and putting in chairs. And there was more than one person that said, I won't be back if you take out those pews. <laughs> they stayed away. The pews were that sacred. I've known congregations that have split over the color of the carpet in the chancel. Yeah, no, it's, I've been doing this for 44 years. You'd be surprised what congregations split over. You know, here at Emmanuel, You've got that great 127-year history. You've got a fabulous organ, a great organist. You've got wonderful, inspiring worship. You've had some amazing pastors in the past, and now you've got great preachers, lay parish assistants, intern and lay assistants. You do an amazing ministry. But they're not the main thing, are they? No, the people of God know that. The main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus Christ, crucified, resurrected, and living. You know, you can come back here week after week, year after year, and no matter who's preaching, 
whatever the title, whatever the scripture text, I hope and pray that you will always hear the same message. The same message. Because the longer I live, the older I get. The more the world I see, the more I hear of other people's life stories, the more I realize that the main thing is always the same. Jesus Christ, crucified, resurrected, and living. Paul put it this way, there's no other foundation for our lives, for our church, than Jesus Christ, crucified, resurrected, and living. When I graduated from high school, I ended up going to Lutheran Bible Institute in Seattle, Washington. I'm frankly still not quite sure how I ended up there because I didn't know anyone who had ever been there. I'd never been to Seattle. I didn't know a soul who'd gone there, but didn't even know much about the school. But somehow or other, in September following graduation, I gathered up most of my earthly belongings, including a brand new set of twin sheets and towel and, and, and washcloth, a blanket, some clothes, and I boarded a plane in Minneapolis. I flew to Seattle. I took a shuttle to downtown to the Olympic Hotel, and, and I stood there. I had just turned 17 or 18, just turned 18 a month before, and I stood there on this street corner waiting for some unknown person to pick me up in some unknown vehicle to take me to an unknown school, meet an unknown roommate, meet unknown faculty. But there I was. And in the year that I was there, as we studied the scripture deeply, God used that to really change my life and my faith. And if there was a phrase or a motto that epitomized that school, it was the two words that were carved at the, in wood at the very front of a small chapel where we worshiped almost every day. Up front, behind the altar, two words, Jesus only. Jesus only. I learned that those words came from the pen of Samuel Miller, who was the first dean of the newly established Lutheran Bible Institute in Minneapolis, our mother school. And they are part of Samuel Miller's poem and song that says this, Jesus only on the mountain, Jesus only on the sea, Jesus only in the valley, there in dark Gethsemane. Jesus only up to Calvary, Jesus only on the cross, Jesus only in all suffering, all things else are empty draws. Samuel Miller put his life into two words. Fanny Crosby put it in three. Give me Jesus. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. And when I am alone, oh, when I am alone, oh, Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Oh, when I come. Oh, when I come to thy, oh, when I come to thy, give me Jesus, <coughs> give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have You can have all this world. You can have all this world. Just 
Just give me Jesus. Samuel Miller, Fanny Crosby, the Apostle Paul, they're all saying the same thing. Boil life down to its essence. When you're lying on your deathbed at the threshold of eternity, they all tell us the same thing. Remember the main thing. Jesus Christ, crucified, resurrected, living, standing at heaven's gate, ready to throw it wide and welcome us into heaven. The people of God know that. The main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. Today, my friends, Joanne and I commend you to Almighty God. He's able to keep you. There's a phrase that Paul spoke. He said, I am sure, I am confident that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. When we part today, it's so good for me to know that whether it's here, there, or in the air, we will see each other again, brothers and sisters, as we cross the River Jordan at the end of our lives and are reunited again in heaven. And I trust that you will remember next week when you walk in here, next time you have council meetings, next time you have a congregational meeting on the 22nd, that you as the people of God will remember that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Will you join me in prayer? God, thank you for the gift of knowing that the main thing is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, our Redeemer, our friend, our companion, our comfort. We praise and thank you, God, for that assurance and that knowledge. And uh, we rejoice in that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Now, dear friends, may the hope of God, the God of hope, fill you with such joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. We sing together our hymn of the day. It's found in the red hymnal, number 717. Let justice flow like stream. Please stand. page three of your bulletin, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the conscious Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. All, All around us, Father, are anxieties and uncertainties which you allow to displace you as, as God. God. Therefore, challenged by your word, we pray for your church, the world, and all of creation, placing our trust in you and assured that you hear our prayers, whether, whether spoken or held in the quiet of our own hearts. Lord, I pray for Ashley and Morgan and Teresa. For the victims of the recent hurricane. For Pastor Steve and Joanne. Georgia children, my sister Georgia, all who suffer with cancer, those who grieve, those who seek elected office, and those in office. For Dan, Kathy, Ellie, Phil, Your word in scripture promises that though struggles are ever present, you are always with us. We give thanks for all who preach your holy word and who work in our midst and around the world for the sake of the gospel. Guide us to persevere in your mission for the glory of your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of restoration, healing, and wholeness of spirit and relationship, Hear our prayers offered for victims of hurricanes, fires, and wars. Comfort them, guide them, and lead them to your desires for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We give thanks, sovereign God, that you are mindful and benevolent, even to us who often neglect your word and your teachings, and who too often are blind to the suffering around us. We pray for those who are afflicted, tormented, grieving, oppressed, and lonely. As people in our communities suffer the effects of layoffs, joblessness, and strains on their livelihood, lead us to be compassionate and helpful. Deliver the strength of your love and compassion to all in need today, and guide us in our relationship to one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. God of resurrection, you prepare a place in the kingdom through Christ's death and resurrection. We give thanks for the saints who have taken their place at your heavenly banquet and who still inspire us to faithful living. And we pray that we too will know the joy of peace in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in the saving grace you freely give, both now and forever. Amen. 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 The peace of the Lord be with you always. And, and also, also with you. you. Let us offer each other signs of our Lord's peace.
Lamb of God, and I will commune the assistance. <laughs>
please rise. Our communion prayer is found on page four of your bulletin. Let us pray. O oh God, our life, our strength, our food, we give you thanks for sustaining us with the body and blood of your Son. By your Holy Spirit, enliven us to be his body in the world, that more and more we will give you praise and serve your earth and its many peoples. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. You'll find a uh, liturgy of farewell that was handed you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have bound us together for a time as interim pastors and people to work for the advancement of your kingdom in this place. We give you humble and heartfelt thanks for the ministry which we have shared in this time now past. We thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for offering us your forgiveness and mercy. Especially, we thank you for your presence with us through this time and for the deeper knowledge of you and of each other, which we have gained. We thank you for opening our hearts and minds again and again to your word and for the feeding, for feeding us abundantly with the sacrament of the body and blood of your Son. Now, we pray, be with those who leave and those with us who stay. And grant that all, of the, that all of us, by drawing ever nearer to you, may always be close to each other in the communion of your saints. All this we ask for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. 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 Our worshiping family is constantly changing. Loved ones come and go in our community's life. We embark on a new era. It is important and right that we recognize these times of passage, of endings and beginnings. Today, we share the time of farewell with Pastor Moon, those for whose term as our interim pastor is ending. Today, thank you, the members and friends of Emmanuel Lutheran Church, for their welcome and support that Joanne and I have received during these past months. And you know, I'm not really good at staying to a script, so <laughs> I'm going to depart from it. I will conclude with those lines before you respond. But it really has been a privilege for Joanne and I to be here. And the Lord has touched us and changed us by being among you these last months. Uh, we've enjoyed the glorious beauty of Montana. We even did the Beartooth Highway last Sunday, and we went into Yellowstone and Lamar Valley, and we had a little luncheon by the red something, uh, past, past the post office in Fishtail. Where did we go? Along the river, we sat and had a picnic. <laughs> and um, we just loved being here. We did make it to Whitefish once for Joanne's birthday. Uh, so we, we crossed some thresholds with you, and we've loved serving with you. And, um, you know, I, I ask for your indulgence and forgiveness for the things that I haven't gotten done or the places where I have intended, but I thank you. Joanne and I both do. You've opened your hearts to us. Not an easy thing to do in short term to yet another pastor who's going to come and go. And you've, you've shown us what the love and faithfulness of Christ looks like on the face of each of you. And um, it, it's just been a joy and a gift and a blessing to us. And as we leave, well, first of all, and then, and then I'm going to hit the script here. You know <laughs> Steve, I'm going to give you this. The stole <laughs> belongs to the congregation. And you've allowed me to grace this congregation by wearing that stole. If you didn't know it, that is a symbol of the yoke of Christ that's placed on us when we are ordained. Joanne 
made my first skull. It was red. She made many of them. But she placed it around my shoulder 44 years ago. And it has served as a very important reminder that this is not about me. It's not about a pastor. It's about the Church of Jesus Christ. And the people of God always remember that the main thing, thing is to keep the, the main thing the main thing. thing. So as we leave, we carry with us many good memories of you all and of the season of blessing, healing, restoration, and reunification we've shared together. We receive your thankfulness and we offer our heartfelt thanks for all the accomplishments in our mission. <laughs> we now acknowledge your heart and we accept that you now leave us as our new We express our gratitude for your time with us. We will remember you and the influence you had in our lives. We need the support of our Thank you. May our time together and our party be pleasing to our loving God and to the risen Christ we are called to serve. To you, the members and friends of Emmanuel, now release Pastor Lean as our interim pastor. Do you offer your encouragement and support to him in the next step in his journey in ministry? We, we do, do with God's help. Do you, Pastor Lean, release the people of Emmanuel from their pastoral relationship with you and offer your prayerful support? For them, as they take the next steps in the journey as the people of God in this place, I do with God's help. Let us pray. O God, whose everlasting love for us, all is trustworthy. Help each of us to trust the future which rests in your care. The time when we were together here in your name saw our joys and our sorrows. Our hopes and our disappointments guide us as we hold close to these cherished memories, but help us now also to move in new directions until the time comes when we are completely one with you and each other, we ask all, all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Pastor Lane, we wish you joy on your journey, surrounded by our love and by the promises of God, the presence of Jesus Christ, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and the communion of all the saints with the worldwide church. Amen. We send you into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
mess with us if you like. It's for all of us, but especially for Pastor and for Lance. We've set a record for being long-winded today. <laughs> they are feeding you before you head home. There you go.